Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be talking to the team from the movie Tank House. We are joined today by Noam Tomashoff, who is the writer and director of the film, Chelsea Fry, who is the co-writer of the movie, the producer, Matthew Cooper, as well as actors Stephen Friedrich and Austin Crute. And Noam and Chelsea, I wanted to start by, um, you know, talking about the aspects of this film that were incredibly personal to you in, in writing the script, because this was so much based on, you know, your own ventures in the theater world, your own experiences in, in kind of like being creatives within the entertainment industry. And I think the film really beautifully speaks to that aspect of like, what does it take of yourself, you know, trying to find that balance and also being in a space that you have to give yourself so fully to. And I was really interested in how that shaped the initial structure and narrative arc that you saw for the film. Yeah, uh, I can kick it off. Um, so yeah, Noam and I, after we graduated, we were both from NYU, we were both having a really hard time getting agents or anybody to know who we were. Uh, and so we started doing sketch comedy and we would just, we kind of just like took it into our own hands and we were like, you know, we would just go make a random sketch on the streets of New York with like two of our comedy friends. And uh, we did that for several years. And um, when we both kind of just decided to make the leap to come to LA, our last kind of idea was this tribute to our time in New York and theater. So we got like 10, 12 of our funniest friends together and we told everybody to pick the worst person they knew in theater school and improvise as that person. And we were kind of like this super pretentious theater couple who you end up seeing in the movie. And uh, we played those parts and we basically just facilitated this insane little improvised short. Um, and it was the most fun I've ever had. I mean, it was so just like, it was really just for us. We both had several other writing projects that we were like desperately trying to get people to read. And this was kind of just like, oh, this is like just a sweet, fun thing to get all our friends together last minute before we leave. And, um, that ended up being the short that went to series fest. And that's how we ended up meeting Matt. Uh, so it was kind of this like beautiful, it was like the one thing that was such a little passion project for us that ended up kind of becoming the first thing that somebody gave us money to make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Funny. And, and um, you know, the, the inception uh, of this all was that um, we, we all, uh, Chelsea and I kind of were desperate to have more of an outlet creatively than, than what was being allowed to us uh, um, you know, just by being actors, like <laughs> some actors might know, especially in New York, there's these things called EPAs, equity yeah. principle auditions. These are uh, mandatory by mandated by the union. that Every union theater production needs to have EPAs. Now, the vast majority of these shows are already cast and these are just a formality. Um, and they'll usually send the most junior casting person just to tick the box of having done this. But there's so many theater actors in New York that everybody wants an appointment. So we used to go to the equity building at 5.45 in the morning so that we could get an appointment for these auditions that we're never ever gonna get cast in, you know, because we're just so desperate to get any sort of opportunity to get on stage and do anything. And then when we sort of connected and we realized that we had this desire to um, make more of our like creative impulses, that's when we started doing those sketches and sort of discovered writing and, and making our own stuff as a, as a potential outlet. Um, and, and I'm very happy that that was the sort of inception of, of this whole thing, because when, when this went to series fest and we, and we met Matt, you know, this was a real lightning strikes moment. It was quite, quite fortunate that we met and that Matt happened to be looking for a project of this sort. Um, but the, you know, the only thing that made that possible was that we did get together and, you know, you used our minimal resources to sort of feature these characters and, and put something together, uh, you know, so that there are impulses, you know, didn't just stay desire, but actually became a thing. 
you know, and, and Matt, obviously, since Noman and Chelsea were both mentioning meeting you at, at Series Fest, you know, I was interested in kind of when you first saw that that initial version, that short, kind of how you really saw an opportunity as like coming on board as a producer for the feature to really support the vision that they had and how they wanted to tell the story and also to kind of work with them through the development process of, of what it takes to take a format and a short and this idea of these characters and really figure out how are we going to make this a feature film? you know, what are all the details that we want to plug in and, you know, how you really wanted to support their vision in, in making this film and help walk them through that journey? Sure. Um, well, the truth is, I didn't know how to do any of it. Um, <laughs> and I truly, 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 no, you, you crack me up when you say, uh, like, I was looking for a, a film like this to produce. I, I was just looking for anything to produce. Any, anything hey. to Yes. Uh, yes <laughs> he approached but, everyone else and they were already occupied. So it's like, well, who's left? <laughs> yeah, you, you guys were the last round. No, um, it's, it was just really, really serendipitous. Um, I grew up on the office and parks and recreation. Um, and so I always had this affinity for comedy, especially comedy that I thought would fit into like a 20, 25 minute, you know, like NBC type show. And when I saw their Tank House short, at the time, I pitched them of this becoming a TV show. Now, I also had no idea how to do any of that. But I thought that that was the natural flow for the story they were telling. That, and instead of it being two Upper East Side New Yorkers moved to upstate New York, that they should go to Fargo, North Dakota. But that is a different story entirely. Um, I really just saw something special in Noam and Chelsea in, in a way that I uh, am quite moved by. Like, I, I really, really, really believe that they are brilliant, brilliant creators. And uh, I mean, they're amazing people, but they're also just brilliant. And I, I tell Chelsea this, but Chelsea did a live reading of a pilot script later that night. Yes, no. <laughs> and she was playing the lead. And I was sitting there with my sister and she was, Chelsea was performing. And I turned to Katie and I was like, she is unbelievable. Like it just, it reinforced everything that I was starting to think after seeing their short earlier that day. And I went up to them and I just said, Hey, you know, I'm Matt, I'm a producer. And you know, I'd love to work with you guys and try and bring this idea to fruition. And like I said, initially, I thought it'd be a TV show. And I guess we, we wrote a pilot and then it was like, wait a second, we can't make an entire TV show and then sell it. So we'll make a movie. And that was easier to raise money for. And then I went to Fargo and it's, it just became this whole snowball of uh, events. But in the end, we rented a you know, a tiny little office on uh, Fairfax with a giant whiteboard similar to, to Noam's creative board there. And the three of us really, these two, and I was like bringing coffee, the three of us, we set out to just write this feature film. Yeah. I mean, that it's a great segue into uh, the other brilliant creators here um, because without them, none of this would be possible, but yeah, I, I'm just very proud to, to have worked with Noam and Chelsea, truly. Uh, they're, they're the best. I, I love hearing that part of the journey and, and so thrilled as well. We're now also joined by Tara Holt. Um, Stephen, I actually wanted to come to you next with a question because, you know, in playing, in playing this role of, of Tucker in the film, he's someone who's so unbelievably dedicated to his craft to the degree that an audience member dying doesn't even phase him because he believes in creating a theatrical revolution that wholeheartedly, yeah. um, you know, and there's so many wonderful comedic spaces that you get to play to within that level of obsession that he has. And I was interested in how you found the lines of like how far you could take it, where it still felt like a real person and a real character before it would have, you know, potentially tipped over into that space of, of just being a parent of a person because we still always understand exactly why he's so driven throughout the film. Sure. No, I had the, the distinct pleasure uh, from the age of like 13 until I, I went off to college of working with a man 
in Charlotte named Alan Poindexter. And he, uh, he was the most passionate director I've ever had in my life. And I think will ever have, uh, because his passion sometimes overflowed into what almost felt like manic hatred for himself. You know, like he was so, his, his ideas were so broad and the budget needed to be so big. And he only had this, this children's theater in downtown Charlotte. So he, he was constantly just like a self-contained atom bomb that was trying to split out of its own seams because he had like all these ideas and it, and it was gonna be amazing. And we could have gone and we could have been something but we only have 20 bucks a day to pay these actors. You know, like that's what it constantly kept on coming back to and, and seeing that every day. I mean, there was one time where he did kind of a, a gender bent uh, role where he played uh, the Wicked Witch in a production of The Wizard of Oz that we did. And at that point we had moved into this bigger theater and it was partnered with the, the children's library. So we had this budget finally. And he comes out in just this incredible, it's, it's uh, like bright orange and, and black and it's all this twisted like Tim Burton-esque things. And finally, like I've only seen him as a director. He comes onto the stage as the Wicked Witch of the West and it was the most terrifying thing that I've ever, <laughs> I've seen Midsommar, you know, like I've seen things, but that like in person watching this man walk out in front of children, it was, it was a children's theater. And all these kids are sitting in the audience and there's the tornado and he comes out and he's just, what? And I, that was, that was where the, the passion, that seed in Tucker, where it's, it's this, um, it's this individual who has such a deep and resounding love for creating and for getting other people to understand the, the art he wants to create and bringing them in. It's not just me talking to you, it's everyone doing uh, but then, you know, that kind of goes a little off the rails in the movie, but you'll have to watch it to see. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of where the, the initial, when I got the first audition, the initial character kind of stemmed immediately from memories of Alan. So It's amazing. I'm glad, glad that you got to know Alan so you could be an inspiration for the character. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Tara, for you, you know, you know in, in playing the role of Sandrine in the film, there's a lot of kind of spaces in between where she's kind of trying to figure out where she fits, you know, in her relationship with Tucker. You know, it's it's this is his idea of like what he wants to do, this theatrical immersion. She's really kind of carried herself along with it. But at the end of the day, it's like her real dream is like network television and getting an audition for the CW is like the pinnacle of success for her, which is very different to what he's pursuing. And even going back to Fargo, for her as well it's it's this space where she's not the same person she was when she left but there's still a part of her that reconnects to that and kind of becomes the person that she was when she was living at home and when she was younger as well um, and so how did that give you a lot of really fun space to play to within the character with all those spaces in between where she's kind of pulled between these two different areas I think it's very comparable to to life you know I feel like um when we're younger or our prior versions of self, we, we are committed towards one view of what we want. And as we grow older, it starts to evolve into something else. And you start to realize you're growing up and you want something a little different and you get more specific with who you are. And especially with Sandrine, I feel like um, her and Tucker at one point did share a very common dream. Um, or maybe, you know, she just fell so deeply in love with him that that was enough for her at that time. But as she started to grow into herself, she realized, um, you know, that her own dreams mattered a lot more than she, you know, realized. And she wasn't um, happy and fulfilled just living um, Tucker's dream any longer. And, um, you know, I think that there's still there. She loves theater and loves what they do. There is a there is that pull between the two worlds because it's not like one or the other. But um, I think, you know, with time, she starts to really uncover who she is and what makes her happy and head in that direction. And I think that the stars sort of started to align for her and pull her in that direction, you know, whether she likes it or not. <laughs> And Fargo, yeah, Fargo always has a, a special place. I mean, it has a special place in my heart. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to, to go back there and um, go back to where it all began. 
I love that. And, and Austin, you know, with your character, Jack, we really get to see him kind of come into his own throughout the film in a lot of different ways. Like the first time that he's performing musically in front of just a small group of his friends in this theater company, you know, there's such an introverted aspect to it. And it's such a hurdle for him to overcome that. And then we see him becoming a really confident performer in himself alongside the trajectory of, you know, him and his boyfriend coming out to both his mom and people around him and what that means for his self-confidence as well. Um, and so how did you want to kind of build that arc in him as a character of just the different ways in which he's really, you know, becoming much more comfortable in his own skin as a performer and as a person? Well, I myself grew up in a very conservative, rural, like I don't want to say rural area. It's Marietta, Georgia, shout out Cobb County. Um, <laughs> and I'm a pastor's kid. I was very, very, very shy as a young, like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like the elementary years. <laughs> then my mother like was not playing with me <laughs> and she really pushed, really pushed um, for me to be in drama and for me to be, you know, doing what I need to do. And I started, you know, doing all of that. And I feel like that, um, also I was closeted until like 2017, y'all. So <laughs> I definitely took that arc and that journey um, into Jack. I feel like Jack definitely in Fargo is trying to find his identity while also identity as a performer, while also an identity as, you know, himself, you know, he's, falling in love with his friend and his mom who has like a high like political position in the town doesn't know and he's trying to keep his reality together while also manifesting the reality that he wants for himself so I think it's very interesting to see that it is. It's, it's a great character arc to get to watch in the film. And, and for all of you, you know, one of the things that comes across so wholeheartedly in the way that you've told this story and through all these characters is, you know, how much art connects people and brings people together. It's not just about these two characters at the center pursuing a desire to be performers. It's about the community that gets built around that, the connection that it builds amongst everybody, you know, and, and obviously, you know, with all of you working in the arts and working in these creative roles, what were the, the important aspects that you really wanted to be able to bring across in this film and to really communicate to audiences about not just what it takes of yourself to be creative in the industry, but also, you know, the, the connection that you can really build with people along the way and the way that storytelling brings people together so uniquely. Uh, well, you know, as, as I reflect on this movie more and more, like the thing that, I, that stands out to me in terms of the, the takeaway, uh, the, you know, for, for people who are involved in the arts and for people who aren't becomes um, the, the, like the, as I say, the cost of this type of lifestyle. Um, you know, on the one hand, it, 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 you build a community around it and it becomes like the place where you kind of uh, can flourish. But um, what I think this shows, you know, for like front and center is uh, just how uh, emotionally costly it can be to live this life fully because it's unpredictable and it is often very chaotic to discover your voice and develop it and to maintain uh, any sort of relationship uh, throughout that process can be extremely difficult, especially when those uh, creative needs deviate uh, from each other. Um, and, I, and as a culture, we require a great amount of media constantly to keep sane and to keep living and not be miserable. We need music and movies and television all the time or else we, we become sad, right? So, and, but we don't often think about what it costs people who are making this to produce the things that we need to do to essentially, for us to be able to outsource our emotional catharsis to them, they actually have to experience it. And that takes a huge toll. Um, so I hope in this small little case, you know, it's just a way to show people like, hey, it's, it is all fun and games, but you know, eventually you do have to pay the piper. And, and that sort of loss and pain ultimately also gets reincorporated back into the artist's identity as well. 
Yeah. I mean, also when we got to Fargo, it was funny because it is so far removed from any epicenters that I've ever taped in besides, you know, there, even when you're down in Atlanta, there's still uh, at least a, a, a larger city there. And so you get to Fargo, it's such a small little town. We got the, we're all getting put up in the same spot. So immediately we all just bonded. And for the first week of shooting, scheduled it out, it was all the, uh, the kind of ensemble shots and the group scenes, which was great because, you know, just hitting the ground running, meeting everybody, bonding, everyone's waking up at the same time, everyone's going to bed at the same time, like there was nothing else to do outside of each other. And then we got to like the third week where you're, you know each other really well, there's no longer like the pleasant comfortability where you, you like, don't say certain things, like we started to become that little uh, misfit group. And then you start to go a little crazy because one of the champagne problems of acting is the, a lot of sitting around and waiting at certain points mostly in air-conditioned places, sometimes not. And there was one point where, you know, you, now we live in a time where you have your phone, you got books, you got everything. You can, you, you, it's a, a privilege to be bored. And so we got to a point where in the third, fourth week of shooting, you're just, you've done all the crosswords on your phone. You've texted everybody, nobody's replying. You've talked to all these people. So there was one point where me and one of our castmates, the insanely talented Sarah Yarkin, we went and walked to a store nearby when we had about four hours of downtime. And we picked up a couple puzzles and we just brought them back. And without saying a word, our whole cast just sat around this table and just put together a massive puzzle. Like a puzzle that beginning of the quarantine would have taken me two or three days. It took us about 45 minutes. It was, that was <laughs> the, the point of just like honed in kind of piggybacking off of each other. I, it felt great. It was a really great, I, I, I'm gonna remember that moment for a while because uh, one, it calmed a bunch of frazzled nerves, but at the same time, uh, it was like one of those bonding experiences that this movie's like kind of about. <laughs> I think that like brings me to my, what how grateful I am to our cast. And, uh, you know, it's, this was like the first kind of larger budget, really anything that Noam and I had done, Matt. And um, it's scary to cast people that you are literally like, these are the most talented people I've ever met. I can't believe they're going to be saying our words. And now we need to bring them to Fargo, North Dakota and give them food and make sure they live for four weeks. And, um, you know, it wasn't a big budget. It was really, really, we were stretching that budget as thin as possible. And that means that, you know, you need people who are game and you need people who are going to be down for the hard days and uh, the long days. And, um, you know, we didn't have fancy trailers. We didn't have those things as much as I would love to give these actors and they deserve it and they get it on their other jobs. But um we didn't have that. And so I, I think when I like look back at the cast we were able to get, who are literally is our dream cast, I'm just so grateful for their time and to get down and dirty. And, you know, you, you hear it like indie films are hard. They're really, really hard. And we just, we just had such a, it was just such positive energy. And I, I feel really lucky about that. And it also was like a le big learning lesson for me and how to approach my jobs. And um, yeah, I just learned so much from the cast. I'm, I'm so grateful. There is a trailer on one day. There was one trailer. One day. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 And there was an N64 in there. Right. We love you too. We love you too. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chelsea, I just really quick, thank you for highlighting like the cast because, and this is not blowing smoke, like you, everyone was so incredible. Like, like you said, indie filmmaking is really, really difficult. And indie filmmaking with a first time team on an ensemble movie in a town that no one's been to before, um, where the set is getting demolished at the end of the week. So we have no ability <laughs> to go and do reshoots. That's a real thing. Um, you do, you need a team, you need an ensemble and their leaders to be game. And uh, it's, it really, it's like, we, we talk about this all the time, like how lucky we got that we had every single person on set as just the absolute pinnacle of uh, professional and talent. And a very special shout out to 
uh, Jim Presser and Caitlin Well for casting because yes. uh, they they knocked it out of the park. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention them. You know, and I mean, speaking speaking of the performances with the cast for you, Austin, Stephen, and Tara, one of the things that is really impressive, you know, and and always a challenge in comedies is is everybody feeling like they're in the same project. You know, we've all had those moments where you're watching something and different people are kind of interpreting the tone or the voice of something differently. And everyone kind of knows exactly what film they're in and, and knows exactly like the comedy, the tone, the voice of the film. And I was interested for the three of you and how you really found that so cohesively together, you know, through the time that you were spending together, you know, silently building jigsaw puzzles, you know, but also the way that the writing really gave you kind of like the intonation and delivery as well. Yeah. Like, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm just a uh, real quick. Um, the <laughs> other day at the premiere, I was talking with uh, two of the insanely talented guys we got to work with, Joe Adler and Devere. And we Devere plays this character named Uther, who is by all means the quintessential definition <laughs> of the word character. Uh, and on paper, it's, it's uh, you'll just have to see it. Anyways, so the character... There, the first shot we did was all of us entering into what became the Tank House rehearsal space. That was the very first thing that we all did, first day of filming. We're all standing behind the door and Joe goes to open the door and he got, and they were like, action. And Joe goes, what am I? All right, this is the, and just launches into this character. And then everyone behind, it was like this ripple effect that I felt through everybody where we were all just like, what the, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And it was just like, we just clicked in everything, any choice, any thought that you had about a character or, or what you wanted to do in that moment, it just became cement. And that was like the, the pulling of the trigger for the next three weeks of the bullet flying through and filming. It was, uh, that was the, the quintessential moment of just like, we all set into those characters, we made those choices and we just ran with it. And thankfully they all worked out, but that I think got us all on the same page pretty quickly. Yeah, I was actually just gonna say a similar thing. Um, it, it felt like from the very beginning, and that's probably why the story you just explained, from the very beginning, we all, we're really on the same page. Um, I also think it's because everyone was so uniquely their character, so perfectly cast as their character. Um, and everyone was so committed to who they were in their characters. Um, it, everyone just um, was so cohesive and, and, and came together in such a beautiful way from the get go, like he just said. And also it made, I just my own personal experience, it made my job seamless because I didn't have to do anything but react off of everyone's insane commitment like just it's super easy to just be there with that with that group of people and and you know there's there's some projects you know when you know you kind of need to bring something more because you're not maybe getting some but this was not the case <laughs> you're getting be <laughs> and I, I think that I believe everyone kind of felt similar so yeah, yeah, it did. It it did feel seamless, like because the characters themselves are meeting each other and then the actors are meeting each other. But I feel like the actors grew a bond even faster than the characters even did. So by the time that it was time for the whole drama troupe to be cohesive, it was just easy because, I mean, me and Luke had... Luke, um, who plays Brady, Luke Roberts, like we had already just developed chemistry and we were, you know, just like, we're supposed to kind of be this duo. And then we came in and then, you know, everybody's there and it's just, yeah, it's really, it was really cohesive and fun. And that warehouse has history. We made history in that warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone now, right? <laughs> I know, right? yeah, it's all gone. <laughs> I love yeah, that. And on, on, a, on the on the highest level, you know, just to echo all of this from an acting and a everything else um, point of view, the, the thing that I am most happy with was um, that we were able to create an environment where I felt that everybody could, um, everyone from the actors to all the different department heads could do the thing that they weren't allowed to do on any other production. 
the thing that would have had to be very much sanded down in order to suit the parameters of something that is more mainstream and normal, right? So, you know, I think you see that a lot in the art department and the costumes. It's like, yeah, that, that thing you've always wanted to do, just do that all the way. And from a character perspective, like, as you said, with Uther and, and all of them, it's like, you know, if you were going to have to take this down 40% for like a TV situation, like, no, now you can do 100%. And, um, you know, hopefully that was fun and uh, cathartic for everyone, you know, the entire time. And Chelsea and Noam, I also wanted to ask you about some of the scenes that, you know, are kind of plays on moments that we've seen in other movies. But what if that's in the world of, of trying to create a theatrical immersion experience? You know, like the idea of a squire riding all the way to Fargo from New York to announce the passing of someone or it's a battle in the alleyway, but it's really, you know, a dialogue warm up between performers, um, you know, in those moments. And I, I was just interested in hearing a little bit about kind of like the genesis of, of taking those ideas of like things that we're familiar with in terms of storytelling structure and then figuring out how that fits into the world of these characters in the story. Well, just to speak on the Squire thing, um, you know, it's, that's, that's a big reach, you know, just for the audience. Like, what is this? Do I, do I remember who that is? Like what's going on? Um, but I think that really comes from this, this idea that we were a part of and also observed in like the theater and the Shakespeare world, that there's this, there's this mentality, this like analog nostalgic mentality that takes over for people who are in the theater where it's like, you know, maybe I am an Elizabethan times. Like maybe I can live that way. Like that's what real acting is all about. Like I'm going to write you a handwritten letter. Like, you know, all these little like cutesy impulses that you get when you're doing this theater from like 400 years ago. So it's like, yeah, theater companies, when they need to talk to each other, they send the squire or the scroll. Like that's just how it is. That's how they do it. <laughs> yeah. And I think in terms of the structure, Noam and I were actually recently just talking about this. It, you know, the there was so much absurdity we wanted to put into the film. And we kind of, being first-time feature writers, we were kind of like, uh, at first we were starting, we were like, let's just scrap like all format, like any way a feature film has been made, like we're going to change it. And then we're like, no, we we're like, there's a reason Save the Cat has worked for a million years. And we were kind of like, let's do a very, very basic classic structure and then just put all the crazy stuff we've ever wanted to put into that. So at least like people can follow the story and also then just kind of be immersed in this absurdity. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I, I hope it was, I, I, think it, I think it led to um, the characters also being more developed than they perhaps would have been. And um, uh, right. yeah, yeah. And, and the major general off in the alley, um, you know, obviously it's ridiculous, uh, but what I think it does on a formal level is it, 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 it solidifies the idea that the, the world of this movie, uh, everyone agrees on the rules. Like we all agree that if you speak faster than me, like I receive a physical injury. Like, and so as the characters, the characters then sort of the, the world, they externalize themselves within the world. So, um, you know, aside from being like a, a funny, surprising thing, I think it also is really important to continue to reinforce the rules of this world because like, it's not the normal world. It is the, the, the reality of Tucker and Sandrine is fully externalized in the rules of the world itself. I, I just want to say on that for the, the general off, like when you get an actor, and this is all Noam's directing, when you get an actor like Richard Kind to show up on set and know the entire dialogue of this, be excited and just do a hundred takes back to back to back. Like it felt like you really were watching this battle. And I, I don't know, I, I think it's a testament to, if you can convince Richard to buy into this world, then you can convince the audience too as well. Well, and even, you know, Tara and Steven too, like I know Tara, you, you worked very hard on knowing that because you had to be the most um, good <laughs> and also kind of do it your own way. And, and you know, I, I knew about Gilbert and Sullivan, obviously, but like not many people do. So to sort of, you know, learn that for the first time, I, I know was it was a big deal. and It was very good. <laughs> Thanks. It was. 
Well, I love hearing all of these details of the film and especially, you know, the genesis of how much of a passion project it was for everyone, because that that joy in the making of it really comes across in the experience of watching it on on screen. It was such an enjoyable film to be able to watch. And thank you so much for talking all about it. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely.